Mr. John C. Goodman is a research fellow at the Independent Institute, president of the National Center for Policy Analysis, and the author of Priceless, Curing the Healthcare Crisis. He's also the uh, inventor of the healthcare savings account. It's a little free market uh, healthcare for you. So, Mr. Goodman, come on up. We're also the place that invented the health savings account. How many of you have one? Okay. Glad to see you do that. How many people in the audience today want your health care to be determined by a bureaucratic and personal insurance company? How many of you want your health care to be determined by employers? Yes? Yes? How about the government? Do you want your medical decisions to be determined by Barack Obama? How about you and your doctor? Well, this is the right kind of audience for me. You know, I carry a cell phone with me when I talk because you never know when you're going to have an emergency, right? The interesting thing about cell phones is there are more of these in the United States than there are people. Even the panhandler on the street probably has a cell phone. But he probably has difficulty getting access to health care when he needs it. If something goes wrong with my cell phone in Dallas, Texas, there are dozens of places I can take this phone to. Without any appointment, whatever. I can get high quality repair. I can get expensive repair. There are even some shops that will send a repairman to my condo my home to repair my iPhone. There's a chain of these uh, uh, repair shops. It's called Eye Hospital. The people who work for them are called Eye Doctors. But if something happens to my body, you know the average wait in the United States today is three weeks to see a new doctor? In Massachusetts and Boston, where we're told they have universal coverage, the wait for a patient to see a new doctor is two months. Amazingly, one out of every five people who enters an emergency room these days leaves without ever seeing a doctor because they simply get tired of waiting. And so the question I have for you today is why is the market so kind to my iPhone and so mean to my body? And the answer I would give is because this iPhone is bought and sold and repaired in a real market with real prices where entrepreneurs know they can make millions of dollars if they satisfy our needs. But in healthcare, we have so suppressed the market for decade after decade after decade that none of us ever sees a real price for anything. No patient, no doctor, no employee, no employer. We have become obsessed with the notion that the way you make healthcare accessible to people is to make it free at the point of delivery. We have bought into the same notion that other countries have bought into, and that is that people should not have to trade off between money and health care. That in the ideal system, when people get care, no money changes hands. And what we have forgotten is that when we suppress the price as a barrier to care, we make all those non-price barriers even more important. What are the non-price barriers to care? Well, how long does it take you to get a doctor on the telephone or to make an appointment to see a doctor with his nurse or receptionist. How many days do you have to wait before you get to see that doctor? How long does it take you to get from your home to the doctor's office? How long do you have to wait in the reception area after you get to the doctor's office? Those are the non-price barriers to care. And there's lots of evidence that those non-price barriers to care are more important than the fee that the doctor charges. Those are the major deterrents to care in this country and in other countries around the world. In the United States, we primarily pay for care not with money, but with time. And the time price of care is much higher than the money price of care, even for the lowest income citizens. In this country, we have about 50 million people who are on food stamps. They can walk into any supermarket that you and I can walk into. They can buy almost any product that you and I can buy. They can pay the same price that you and I pay. They take their goods to the checkout counter, they put the food stamps down, they put money on top of it, and they consummate the transaction. You almost never hear it said that low-income people in this country have a problem access to supermarkets. 
Now, there may not be one in their area, but there aren't any supermarkets that say, we don't take food stamps. Okay, there's no problem with access. There are another 50 million people, basically they're the same 50 million people, who are on Medicaid. And the biggest problem for people on Medicaid is they can't find a doctor who will see them. And when they can't find a doctor who will see them, what do they do? They turn to community health centers or the emergency rooms and safety net hospitals where they wait for their care. At Parkland Hospital in Dallas, where I live, the waits in the emergency room are four, five, six hours, depending upon the day. In fact, we had a case a couple of years ago of a man who went to the Parkland Hospital emergency room and waited 19 hours and died before he ever, uh, before a doctor ever saw him. Um, notice that in the food market, we allow low-income people to add to the government subsidy and pay the market price. But over in the healthcare area, we do not do that. I was in Boston about uh, a year ago, and a woman cab driver uh, told me about what it was like under Romney Care. And uh, I said, well, how does it work? And she said, well, I guess it's okay, but I'm having trouble finding a doctor who will see me. And I said, well, tell me about that. And she said, well, I had to go down a list of 20 names before I found a doctor who would see me. And I said, were you going down the yellow pages? And she said, no, no, I was going down the list that Medicaid gave me. That's the way Medicaid works uh, for so many low-income people in this country. Now, there are 1,300 walk-in clinics in this country. They're in CVS pharmacies, they're in Walmart, uh, they're in shopping malls. And um, these walk-in clinics post their prices. Uh, they provide efficient care, or quality care, timely care. In the CVS pharmacies are called Minute Clinics. And the reason for the name Mini Clinic is because they're signaling to you they know that your time is valuable as well as your money. If we allow low-income people to buy health care the way they buy food, they will be able to go into the walk-in clinic, add to Medicaid's rate, pay out-of-pocket with money, and pay the market price. But we make that illegal, worse than illegal. We make it criminal for, uh, for anybody in health care to take money on top of Medicaid's payments. In Dallas, Texas, they charge at a minute clinic for a sore throat or, uh, or, or an ear infection is about $75. The Medicaid rate is half of that amount. And that's why the minute clinic doesn't take the Medicaid patient. We can make health care accessible, primary care accessible, to millions and millions of low-income people throughout the country uh, tomorrow if we would simply allow low-income people to buy primary care the same way they are allowed to buy food. Now instead, Obamacare moves us in the opposite direction. Obamacare means suppression of markets even more so than in the past. And there are six really, really bad things that you need to be aware of. Number one, you're going to be required to buy a health insurance plan whose cost is going to grow at twice the rate of growth of your income. Barack Obama didn't create the cost ex escalation problem. It's been going on for 40 years. But what it will do is it will lock you onto that path. It's going to limit your ability to protect yourself. You don't have to be a mathematician or an accountant or an economist to know that if you're forced to buy something whose cost is growing at twice the rate of growth of your income, eventually it's going to crowd everything else out. In fact, we're on a path to go out to mid-century where today's college students will reach the retirement age. They will have nothing but health care. They will have nothing to eat, no place to live, nothing to wear. They're going to have lots and lots of health care. That's the path uh, that we are on. Um, that clearly is an impossible path, and a lot of pain will be suffered before we get off of it. The second problem with Obamacare is it has a weird system of subsidies. This hotel down the street, most of the workers you see there are making about $15 an hour. The maids, uh, the waiters, the waitresses, the busboys, the custodial folks. Uh, $15 an hour means they're making about $30,000 a year. Obamacare will require that hotel to buy a health insurance plan that for families will cost $15,000, which is about half of what the company is paying the workers. And there is not in the Obamacare legislation any additional help for the employer or for the employees. It simply requires them to do that. But if these low-income workers can somehow get over to a health insurance exchange, then the government pays for almost all of the insurance. They don't have to pay 2% of their income. The rest is subsidized by taxpayers. And so there's going to be enormous incentives for the hotels to find some way for their low-income workers to get over to these health insurance exchanges. 
Do they fire them? Do they make them part-time employees? Do they make them contract workers? I don't know how they're going to do it, but I know they're going to have huge incentives to do it. For the higher income worker, the incentive is exactly the reverse. For people making, say, $100,000 a year, they get no help in the insurance exchange. But if they get insurance at work, the employer premiums avoids a 25% income tax, a 15% FICA Social Security tax, another 6 or 7% state and local income tax. Essentially, for higher income workers, government through the tax system is paying for almost half the cost of the insurance through the place of employment. So what we're going to have is companies divide in two. And some companies will employ above average income workers, and other companies will employ below average income workers. And the bad thing about all that is if you want to be competitive in the marketplace, you don't want those kinds of decisions to be made in response to subsidies. You want those to be made on the basis of economic realities. The third problem with Obamacare is that if you have to go into the exchange to buy your insurance, you're going to find insurance claims that have very, very perverse incentives. If an insurer has to charge the same premium to everybody who enters the plan, then you don't have to think for very long. You don't even have to be in the business to know they're going to make a profit on healthy people and losses on sick people. So they're going to try to attract the healthy and avoid the sick. And the perverse incentives don't stop at the point of growth. Once people are enrolled, their incentive is to over-provide to the healthy, to keep the ones they have and attract more of them, but under-provide to the sick because they certainly don't want to attract any more of them and they don't want the ones that they have. You want to be in a health plan that has an incentive to under-provide to you, to deny you care if you have a serious health problem, well that is where we're headed. And what we have in the marketplace today, as imperfect as the current system is, if you get insurance to an employer or through a broker, you at least have a protector and a defender. Your employer helps you when you have a problem with a system that really can be very impersonal and quite, at times even quite hostile to you. But when that employer goes away, when that insurance broker goes away, you're going to be on your own dealing with a bureaucracy that has no interest in dealing with you if you have a serious health care problem. And then on the buyer side of the market, we have perverse incentives as well. Because the penalty, if you don't buy insurance, is actually quite small. It's not even clear that it's going to be enforced. If it is enforced, it will be weakly enforced. And therefore, people will have an incentive to remain uninsured while they're healthy, wait till they get sick, then buy the insurance, get the bills paid, and then drop the insurance again. In Massachusetts, these are called jumpers and dumpers. People jump in when they get sick, and they dump the plan after they get bills and their bills paid. If we all do that, then the cost of insurance is going to get really, really high, so high that no one can afford it. And uh, when no one can afford it, the private insurers are all going to leave the marketplace. The fifth problem is our safety net institutions are going to be decimated. Obamacare has way over promised. It's made promises that it cannot keep. If the uh, predictions are accurate, in two years we're going to insure about 30 million new people. If the economic studies are correct, they will try to double their consumption of health care. In addition, all the rest of you will have to have more generous insurance than you would otherwise want. There will be a whole long list of preventive services that you have to have with no deductible, no copayment. And what I'm describing is a huge increase in the demand for care, but under this law there is no change in the supply of doctors or nurses or health clinics. Huge increase in demand, no change in supply. What happens? We've got a huge rationing problem. In that kind of world, you don't want to be in a plan that pays below market because if you're in a plan that pays doctors less than what Blue Cross pays, you're going to be at the end of the waiting line. And the waiting line is going to grow longer and longer and longer. It's already happening. It's going to get worse in about a year and a half. Who are the people who are in plans that pay below market? Well, they're the most vulnerable populations. They are the elderly and the disabled in Medicare. They are poor people in Medicaid. And if Massachusetts is the standard, they will be the new people in the government subsidized insurance plans sold in health insurance exchanges. Surprisingly, all the Democrats in Congress who voted for Obamacare, I think they're going to be quite shocked when they discover that many of their constituents have less access to care, not more access to care, uh, as a result of Obamacare. And finally, our senior citizens are really put at risk by this legislation. 
$716 billion over the next 10 years will be taken out of Medicare to create a new entitlement for young people. How is it going to be taken out of Medicare? Well, they're going to push the rates down so that for hospitals there's no difference between the Medicare rate and the Medicaid rate. For doctors, the Medicare rate is going to fall below the Medicaid rate. Seniors will be lined up behind welfare mothers um, searching for care. They will be the ones now going to the community health centers and the emergency rooms of safety net hospitals. Well, lots and lots of studies have shown that Medicaid is lousy insurance. In fact, studies show that if you call doctors and say you're uninsured, you can get an appointment sooner than if you say you're on Medicaid. Lots of studies show that the survival rates for cancer and other diseases are well below what they are in private insurance. And that's where our seniors are, are going. Now, we have a new book out called Priceless, and we're going to have a book signing, I guess, over here uh, in just a few minutes. So we want you to buy a copy of this book. Uh, I have an expensive mortgage on my condo and a car payment and other bills, and so I need the royalties. But beyond that, I think you're going to like this book. I think you're going to find that there's nothing like it in the health policy arena. Uh, I met Ron Paul 20 years ago when I came out with the book Patient Power. He really liked that book. That was the book that introduced the notion of health savings accounts. He had me on his TV program and beamed back to his constituents. And he's been a fan of, 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 of consumer directed health care ever since. Uh, he believes in patient power. I believe in patient power. We want you to get behind patient power and buy this book. Thank you very much.